nothing more exciting than a hot microphone to a man of total ego. Merry Christmas to you. Ring-a-ting, ring-a-ting, ring-a-ting. Uh, just one moment here, please. Mm -hmm. May I? May I? Happy Friday. Hey, yeah, a fantastic thing happened today. I mean, to me, you know, to, you, you tend to think of, of, uh, of old Ma Bell as being totally, uh, totally faceless. Completely uh, unapproachable, right? Well, today, I picked up the phone and I dialed information. You know, it goes, bah, bah. I pick it up, and this girl says, uh, and I hear her, you know, her, she's been saying something to somebody, obviously, before she talked to me, possibly somebody there in the office, you know, and she's laughing. Remember, I'm calling information, see, she's laughing. <laughs> she says, oh, thank God it's Friday. I said, excuse me? She says, uh, thank God it's Friday. I says, you know, that's true, baby. I said, uh, uh, it is it is true. Thank God it is Friday. And she says, not only that, it's Friday, but if there's a holiday coming up. I said, yes, that's true. I said, not only that, we got, we got a three-day holiday. Everything's fine. She says, thank God it's Friday. Merry Christmas. I said, Merry Christmas. I hung up. It hit me. I didn't get my information. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> it was a great little moment, see? And, uh, you know, a lot of great little moments in this town. And one of the great things about New York is, is it's just absolutely like no other city. Now, today, I was up on the 24th floor of this building. It's right on Broadway, right in the middle of New York City. For those of you who don't know where we, uh, you know, where the show here originates, it comes from the heart of Manhattan. I mean, the real heart. Well, I don't know if you could call this a heart. Now, if you were going to take... Uh, Manhattan, and you were going to describe the, you know, Manhattan in terms of various portions of the anatomy. I'm not so sure that this part of Manhattan would be called the heart. I can think of some of other. <laughs> well, after all, Times Square, you know, the porny world. But uh, nevertheless, I'm I'm looking out of the windows, <laughs> and it's about four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon. You have all these these office buildings all around us. These great big white aluminum glass buildings, millions and millions of, of, of windows and lights. And it was about 5 o'clock, so it was just getting dark. And it, at that point, of course, you realize this is just about the shortest day of the year, you know. <laughs> it is. The 21st, sure. And, and it was dark. It was getting dark already. I'm looking out, and all the offices were lit. And from my... From the window, I was looking at it. We were looking at an, a level, see, with all these offices, 24 stories up. I, I counted six Christmas parties that you could see just looking out of the window, looking around at the office. You these people, you know, dancing on the desks and yelling and hollering. I counted six Christmas parties, one fist fight, and uh, something else which we will not discuss at this time because there are women and children. And uh, it certainly it certainly gives you a sense of total space and time, space stretching out on all sides of you, millions of people striving, grasping, groping uh, for all kinds of things. But uh, in this particular instance, as we are using allegorical terms, grasping and groping for meaning and truth and, and uh, beauty and uh, joy to the world. And there they were. I could see them. Six of them. Officers that knew not of the existence of the other. Oh, I like that. Oh, let's hear it. Come on, Joe. Hit it. Watch this now. Bring it up big. Here we go. Big, big, big. Oh, listen to this. Wow. Oh, man. That's fantastic. Do it again. Oh. Again, again, and again. Again, I say, let's hear it. Come on, let's hear those timpanies. I want to hear that English horn. I want to hear them flutes. Hit it big, man. Here we go. Woo! Oh, wowee. 50,000 watts drifting out all over the countryside. Bring it up big, Joe. Boom, boom, boom. Sounds like the Phantom of the Opera. 
seated at a vast cosmic organ playing on... Let's see. Okay. That was good, you know. But watching these parties, you know, I'm thinking it's Christmas time. What the heck? We might as well, we might as well let it all hang out and uh, over this weekend. And uh, by the way, speaking of letting it all hang out, let's get a couple of these commercials done here fast, Joe. Just to whip over to the commercial department there and let's hit them with a the magic deal. The world's greatest magicians perform at the World Festival of Magic and the Occult, the weirdest show on earth. An unforgettable experience. Bring the whole family to hold each other's hands. The World Festival of Magic and the Occult, the weirdest show on earth. Wednesday, December 12th through Sunday, December 30th at the Felt Forum in Madison Square Garden Center. For ticket information, call 212-564-4400. Tickets also at Ticketron. Yes, very good. Gee, the most magical show on earth. Let's, uh, you know, uh, watching that uh, Christmas party scene going on there. <laughs> I, uh, uh, is it my imagination or have... Christmas parties proliferated. Are there more Christmas parties, I mean, corporate-type Christmas parties, than in previous seasons? Well, I would have to say I think so here. Seems like there's one on every floor. Every department is having its own party. Which, uh, is the, you know, uh, oh, yeah, I saw... I saw. In fact, I, I saw one little party going on down in the lobby downstairs. And it was a party of guys, just guys who had been fired during the past year. And they got together. They were having uh, the discharge E, uh, <laughs> the, the discharge E 42nd Street Unemployment Office party. It was kind of nice. They all stood around there with their relief checks, and they were drinking third-rate booze. And it was, you know, you could see their poor old run-down shoes and their tattered coats. But somehow, the season had transcended all that. So, uh... Now, Christmas, you know, has a certain panache. It certainly does. Panache. You haven't had it? That's when they take these pecans and they grind it all up with with sugar and icing and all that, and they bake it. Yeah, this is a, they call those panaches. Well, of course, again, there you're dealing with uh, with the lack of communication. And uh, while we're on the subject, <laughs> we're on the subject of of communication. I would like to. Uh, I would like to uh, come right out here and openly and say this, that uh, this is also a time of, of, uh, of a basic itinerant trauma. I imagine right now, listening to the show, there must be at least 500 kids, or maybe 5,000 kids, who are about to be totally depressed with what they get for Christmas. I mean, you know, you, you, your hopes are high, and the next thing you know, you get this uh, this thing. And... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't pan on you, and you have to pretend you like it and all that. You, you've gone through this thing. You say, oh, wow. Oh, gee whiz. Oh, wow, it's great. Uh, uh, gee, it's got a knob on it. Yeah, very good. Uh, yes. Uh, I see you wind it up. Temperature. Yes. <laughs> well, one, uh, one of the great traumas of my childhood came as a result, and this is going to be a kid story. I might as well tell you. And I'm doing this as a public service, not nostalgia. Forget the nostalgia jazz. This, that stuff makes me, uh, makes me. Uh, how can I say it? That makes me want to flow up. To quote uh, Dorothy Parker, <laughs> it does. Oh wow! Uh, you know, I go, I go past those. There's th thousands of stores down the village where they're selling old toys. You know, and these people come in. I go past those stores so fast, it's almost like I'm going past a store that is selling cold sores. I can pass very quick. Yes. You like that illusion? Pretty sickening for a Christmas party. But uh, never... Well, I've been to the swell to the public. Listen, I've been to places where they sell worse than cold sores. And uh, again, I don't want to talk... I don't want to bring it up here. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I've had... Uh, I've been around. I've been there, friends. I've been there. We all have. I mean, oh, we have all tasted the, the, uh, the stream of life as it goes flowing on down to the mountains of beauty and truth. Yes, we have. We have come crawling up through the jungle of our existence, and we have sniffed at those pools. We've even sometimes drunk deeply. So, uh, nevertheless, no, no, yes, we have. We all have. Now, what I would like to do, though, tonight, I, I want you to, to settle down. 
class. Uh, what what I would like <laughs> what I would like to do tonight would be to, as a part of a public service, to give you a little allegory of what can happen uh, if if the wrong gift is laid on a kid. It can be a traumatic experience that can last for hundreds of years. Uh, and, you know, this is the kind of thing that Freud never talked about. Freud thinks that all traumas have a basic sexual background. No way. Uh, there have been many, tra I mean, not in the 20th century. You know, he was a 19th century type. Uh, a very different world. The 20th century, many of our traumas involve materialist things, things of material natures. I wonder how many people have been thoroughly soured on the world because at the age of 16, they bought their first car after saving and struggling and going to the used car lot 400 times, and they drive it out, and three days later discover that it has a balsa wood transmission, a silly putty differential, and gets three miles to the gallon of oil. Don't even mention gas. <laughs> this, and in that way lies real disillusionment. Especially when you turn up with a cracked block the first day that it goes below 30 degrees. And you discover that you had a cracked block right from the beginning and what it was plugged up with was Wrigley's double mint gum. I actually saw a guy buy a car that had a block that was cracked that was stuffed up with Wrigley's double mint gum and by the way covered over with lamp black. No way you could see it. And I'm sorry, your experience with automobiles is somewhat limited if you have not seen that kind of chicanery pulled. And uh, I'm not here to disillusion you, nor to talk of uh, disappointment uh, to talk of uh, despair, I'm here tonight to give you a public service, friends. A public service. And would you give me a, a, another great blast on the horn in there? The first one, Joe, the first one we played. That's a, another great blast on the public service horn, please. There it is. There it is. This is this is wonderful. Bring it up big there. Of course, public service means that you're involving yourself with mankind in general. Uh, the vast swarm of the human beehive. Uh, you are giving them largesse. And so let's hear some great public service music. Yes, as, yes that's, fine. that's fantastic. As part of our vast public service programming, we bring you tonight a lesson by God that you will not forget. Hey, come on, cut it out. Cut it out. Come on, Richard. That's that Richard Strauss, you know, and he's so, such a show-off. Can you imagine what kind of an ego it takes for a man to sit down to write a piece of music like that? And he says, it tells what my soul feels. Oh, my God. This is W.O.R., friends. I knew you'd, I knew you'd be mad when I said that. This is W.O.R. New York, right? The Big Apple. Uh, do you have an echo chamber in there for me, Joe? Let's try it. W.O.R. The Big the Apple. Big Apple. Big Apple. And then, no, we're not the Big Apple. This is the Big Apple where we are, right? The Big Taffy Apple. Uh, but uh, we do have a couple of little commercial inky poos. And for those of you who are coming into town over the weekend, uh, you know, uh, and would like to lay into some good beer and listen to some pretty good music, watch some classic old-time mu uh, movies, uh, they have live Dixieland bands, they dance on the table, they yell and sing and wear straw hats, they have shrimp, chicken and burgers and fantastic suds. You know what suds are, don't you? Right. Oh, they wonder. Suds are, oh, yes, yes, indeed. We're talking about the your father's mustache. Your father's mustache. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an old village tradition. It's been on there so long that you kind of take it for granted. But those that crowd, every time you go past it, you hear them yelling and hollering and, and uh, the band playing. You know, you've been past there, Jerry. It's at the corner of 7th Avenue and 10th Street, right in the heart of the, of the village. And uh, they have ladies' night every Monday. And uh, they, it, now, one thing, if, you walk, if you're going to the, uh, your father's mustache, which is famous all over the country, your father's mustache at 10th, and uh, that's 10th Street and 7th Avenue, if you walk in there, now they have an admission charge. Now, if, if uh, you walk up to the guy and say, Excelsior, you fat head, he will let you in free. That's Excelsior, you fat head. 
Now, when you get up after he hits you, uh, he will then let you in free. And your evening has started off great. You'll have shrimp, chicken, burgers, and they're open. Thing, you know? It's all right. Uh, you'll find it's fine. That's the, the address again is 7th Avenue and 10th Street. And, you know, Dixieland, banjo players yelling and hollering, beer drinking, classic old-time movies of yesteryears. All that stuff goes on there. 7th Avenue and 10th Street, your father's mustache. Should be pronounced with two Ds. Your father's mustache. Much better. Now, uh, by the way, uh, we, we uh, now must go into our true public service. Now, I, I, I must say that at certain times of your life, at certain ages of your life, you're more, uh, how can I say it? You're more vulnerable. Now, it varies. Vulnerable to what? The buffets of fate. You react to them. Other times, it bounces off like, a, like BBs bouncing off a Kodiak bear. Now, why is this? No, well, nobody quite knows. But one of the most, uh, well, one of the most sensitive and vulnerable periods in your life is roughly between the time you're 10 and 13. you agree with that? Yes, you are no longer a kid. This is one of the problems. You're no longer a kid. You're not really a kid type. Now, what is a kid? Well, a kid is one of those little, one of those little things you see running around that can walk right under the coffee table. You know, that's what a kid is. You've seen kids. All of you have seen kids. You know what they are. Uh, you know, they drip and all that stuff, and they run around, and nose runs and all. Uh, they are, let's put it this way, latent human beings. Now, I do not accord them genuine human being status at that point. I do not accept every two-legged creature that walks around and eats McDonald hamburgers as a human being merely because he claims he's of the same species. I will not accept this. A human being must prove to me that he is a human being. You have not yet proven it, Joe. Take you a couple of years. When I begin to see the flicker of native intelligence in those horn-rimmed glasses, I will say that there's a possibility you may arise above your present anthropoidal state. However, <laughs> oh, come on, don't take those glasses off. That'll do you no good. I see nothing then. You take those glasses off and the world becomes sort of a curious, fuzzy Brillo pad. Yeah, that's what I mean. And you're swimming through it. Right. Well, uh, I, I, I say, though, that, uh, that between 10 and 13, this is a dangerous period. And if you have a, a person in that, uh, in that category to whom you are about to give a gift, be careful. Be very careful. Because you can make a drastic mistake this person is not a kid any longer, nor is he yet a walking around, qualified, totally accredited human being. He's not, he really isn't. He's not, he's not. So if you give him a shirt, he's not, you know, he's not a flip. You give him a pair of socks, you know, the kind of thing you give uh, uncles. Uh, the kind of thing you give fathers. You give, you give a, especially if he's a boy, you, you whip a tie on him. Uh, well, you know, or give them a matched set of jockey underwear. Yeah. You know, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like it. They, look at the, the rubber bands work on it. Yeah, I've seen it. Oh, gee. Oh, wow. It doesn't make any difference if you wrap it in Christmas paper. Paper is only paper. Once you open it up and it turns out to be, let's say, uh, a pair of sleeve garters, a kid's level, of, forget it for the rest of his life on you. You agree with that? Well, you better listen. The question is not to agree. The question is we're dealing with basic human truths that one cannot agree or disagree with. They are there. Do you agree with gravity? No, you don't agree with gravity. That's implying that if you didn't agree with gravity, that there was a matter of difference of opinion. When one disagrees or agrees, one is a, was implying that this is a matter of opinion. You do not agree with gravity. You submit to gravity. That's very different. I will tell you this. If, if you find yourself falling off a 12-foot a ladder, are you agreeing with gravity? As you approach the ground, traveling at a high rate of speed with your neck uh, hitting, the, 
hitting the surface first? No way. You're not agreeing with gravity. You fight it every way. But you submit. So I will tell you there are certain things that one does not agree nor disagree with. One merely says this is the way they are. There are two basic styles or models of human beings, the male and the female. I'm speaking, of course, biologically, not psychologically. You may be one or the other psychologically. But we are speaking of biologically. There is the male and there is the female. This is not a matter of opinion. Many medical textbooks have pointed it out. Now, we all know that medicine quite often is, uh, is in a primitive state, but they're not that primitive. Uh, they, 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 almost every doctor I know will agree that there are males and there are females. Now, I did not say masculine and feminine. Did you notice that? I said there are males and there are females. Okay, now that's a basic fact. Now, another basic fact is that one begins at age zero, roughly, in one's travels through life. Now, as one begins, one is at the zero point. You're a kid. You're, you're, you're not even a kid yet. You're a blob. You're, you're a pablum-ingesting blob. True? At age zero. Then you slowly begin to change. You switch from pablum to Rice Krispies. This is an important moment. You may even switch to Ralston. Or, or cream of wheat. You may even switch to Wheaties with Super G. Although uh, these days, uh, Wheaties is now uh, advertising themselves. You've got to grow up to eat Wheaties. He's a man now. Have you seen the commercials? He's a man now. He's ready for Wheaties. This is a whole new concept where the uh, cereal is part of the fertility and, uh, uh, let's say, the maturity rights of our time. You've broken away from... Uh, cocoa malt, you've broken away from Count Chocula and uh, Fruit Loops, and you're ready for Wheaties. That, uh, of course, means that you're ready to go out and chase women and the whole bit. But that's something else. We're not about to lay that on you. But at the age of 11, now that's a very important age. I was 11. Never forget it. I was 11. I, you know, there were kids in the neighborhood like Tommy Van Hoos. Uh, these were kids, you know, little things that came up about to your knees. And uh, they they hung around back under the you know under the back porch in the back and dug in the ground and and uh, fooled around like those were kids right that was a kid and uh, then there were kids like across the street uh, there was Lawrence Stryker who had a letter with a great big H on it seventeen feet tall played on a basketball team now he was a grown up heroic human being to me at eleven. I was suspended in between. On the one hand, Tommy Van Hoos, who continually leaked. Yes, he dripped all over the place. Uh, all possible ways he dripped. Uh, that was Tommy Van Hoos, who was an uh, absolutely despised kid. He was a kid. We'd go out and play ball. Tommy Van Hoos was always lurking in the weeds, sniveling, uh, that kind of thing. He was a kid. On the other hand, Lawrence Stryker would never even bother to watch our ball games. He would go by with his with his old man's car, wearing his purple letter with the white H, with this blonde on his arm. Now that was another kid. <laughs> he was no kid. That was a that was a you know that was a hero, a real hero. So along came Christmas time. Now Christmas was very important at eleven. I mean, people came and gave me you know he gave you presents. When you're eleven years old, you are an unabashed materialist. You do not you do not apologize for your desire for material things. It's very rare that a kid apologizes to his own man. Well, you see, Dad, I, I hate to admit it. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you asked me when I went for Christmas. Well, let's see. I'd like to start with a 10-speed Italian bike. And uh, no way is he going to apologize for that. He says, this is what he wants. So I am 11, and I had this aunt, uh, my Aunt Glenn. Now, they were pretty well off. My Aunt Glenn, she had this husband who was my uncle Tom you have not heard me talk much about my uncle Tom he was a mysterious uncle uh, every family has a kind of a mysterious uncle 
who is who only makes an occasional ritualistic appearance, like at a wedding, uh, at a funeral, uh, at Christmas. They arrive in a car and then they de then they depart. And uh, my uncle Tom was a large man who wore vests. Now nobody else in my my family ever wore a vest, but he had this black vest with a chain across it. Impressed me fantastically when I was a kid. Had his gold chain, and hanging on a chain was a large tooth. He was uh, a member of, an, of a lodge, and it had a tooth. He was an elk. <laughs> and he had this, this tooth that was apparently an elk's tooth. And it was a really biggie. And uh, so he was a very official uncle, and he was reputedly a bootlegger. Well, we never really talked much about that at the age of 11. One does not discuss the financial uh, resources of one's uncle. They're just there. He's an uncle. So my Uncle Tom came over every Christmas, and my Aunt Gwen, and they would have these great gifts for me and my kid brother. You got it. Because they had a little delicacy, and they, they would be really great gifts they'd come out with. Up to that point. Now remember, prior to age 11, I was still pretty much in the same general class as Tommy Van Hoos. Up to that point, I had been a walking around kid, but now I have, uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, the yeast has uh, begun to flow in the veins, various other things. My, uh, my uh, brains are beginning to solidify and, and vague ideas are beginning to come through. So I am no longer a basic kid. Well, on this 11th, this particular 11th Christmas, the big day came, and it was it was on Christmas Day. Now, all of our Christmas gifts in our family were always exchanged on Christmas Eve. You know, two different types of, of family. We had the Christmas Eve thing. And, yeah, we never had the, the Christmas Day was not our bag. Christmas Day was the day we went over to see my grandmother. And that was a bore, a fantastic bore as a kid. I hated that. But we'd all go to see my grandmother, and, and that we'd sit around, and, and uh, they would have uh, turkey and all that kind of stuff, and and uh, had to wear this uh, this uh, you know my mother put me in a, a shirt and all that jazz. Well, but Christmas Eve was something else. Christmas Eve was when all the gifts were around. Well, always Christmas morning, my aunt Glenn and my uncle Tom would arrive in the car. Well, they did. They arrived this Christmas, it's 11. Now, this is the point of total trauma. I just want to warn you, this story is sickening. It is sickening. And I don't want anybody to write in and say, Shepard, that was a sickening story. Why are you telling that to, to kids and, and, and ladies listening on Christmas? Well, it's a warning, because a lot of you are going to go out and get Christmas gifts over this weekend, and I want to warn you, if you've got a kid that's between 11, 10, and 13, be careful. You're liable to give that kid a scar, and he's liable to hate you for the rest of his life. And you won't know it, because he'll fake it. He will fake it. And so Christmas morning was cold. Temperature was maybe five below zero, as it often is in northern Indiana at this time of the year. The wind was howling down from Canada, coming down the Lake Michigan there like a gigantic force of nature, which it was, bringing with it nothing but stygian, cold, tremendously icy air <sighs> was whistling down. And everything for miles around was covered with long, heavy icicles. In fact, we had icicles that would go from the roof of this house we lived in all the way to the ground sometimes, these great big wide babies. And, oh, <laughs> and sometimes northern Indiana being what it was, those icicles would not melt until late July. Ooh, the wind is roaring down, and they're all excited. See, it's uh, it's Christmas morning, and all the papers all over the floor, you know, with the, the, the Christmas presents of the night before, and all of our stuff is laying out. We had the loot that we had gotten, me and my kid brother whooping it up and yelling and hollering, and the Christmas tree is smelling like a Christmas tree smells. And at 10 o'clock that morning, that afternoon, we were going to my grandmother's house. But the one big bright spot of Christmas Day, not only, you know, all the stuff you got, 
but the fact that my Aunt Glenn and Uncle Tom came over, and this could be, let's say, a big bonus jackpot, as it had so often in the past before. I'll never forget the time my Aunt Glenn scored heavily with a thing. Did you ever hear of Lincoln Logs? Did you ever hear of Lincoln Logs? Well, I got this set of Lincoln Logs from my Aunt Glenn one time. Lincoln Logs, you know what they do? They're logs with little notches in them. And you put them together. You just put them together. You make all kinds of things. You can make forts. You can make houses. And, so, and, I, and I must have been about eight. That was a fantastic gift. It was really great. Another time, she laid on me a fantastic gift, which even at this time, I wish I had it. It, 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 would, it would bring a little, uh, little of the roses in my cheeks in the office one, one day, you know, when the salesman had been particularly obnoxious that day. I'd like to sit there and put together my erector set again. And, uh, you know, just sit there and, and, and plunge into the world of the erector set. Did you ever have one? Well, my Aunt Glenn gave me an erector set, the Model 14 erector set, which had in it an electric motor. That was the, the primo electric. Yeah, that was the real electric. You know, that was the real erector set. Because you could make a uh, Ferris wheel. Put the motor up, and the Ferris wheel would go around like Billy Bee Of course, the problem is it didn't have any gears in it. When you when you started this, this uh, it was like uh, having a gigantic wearing blender right in the middle of the living room. Built, uh, it just went around. I tell you, it chewed up the rug and everything else. But it was there, and it was a great gift. So, so she had a reputation as a great gift giver until this morning. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, the wind was blowing, and Aunt Glenn and Uncle Tom drove up the driveway in their car, this big black car, this Buick, and they came up bearing gifts, big boxes in their arms, you know, oh, fantastic. They always had a gift from my old man, like one, uh, one great uh, Christmas, uh, Uncle Tom gave my old man a new jack for his car. Since my old man was always having flats, that was a terrific gift. It was a, it was a presentation model jack and an ivory handle. Beautiful. Came in a lizard skin case. And uh, that was a great gift. Uh, they used to give my mother great gifts, like uh, old, like uh, lingerie. You should have seen her hanging over the sink in this pink lingerie with black, <laughs> black touches, you know, hanging onto her Brillo pads with the sink squirting coffee grounds all over her. But that was... You know, that was, these were great gifts. On this particular night, or morning, things changed, and I never looked at the world quite the same after that. Aunt Glenn says, and now for you, Merry Christmas. She hands me this box. It was a big box. It wasn't very heavy, though. And she turns to my kid brother and says, and for you, Randy, here's your gift. She hands him a box. His box was not much bigger than mine, but uh, it was very heavy. So we both says, oh, thanks. She says, are you going to open it? Silly question. Are we going to open it? So my kid brother, immediately, he's got these claws. He, 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 being a couple of years younger than I was, you see, he was basically uncivilized. He just grabs his box. Ah! He tears it open. You know, the paper flies. He got this magnificent low-winged airplane. A beautiful airplane. I wish I had it now. Man, if I had that airplane, uh, it would be a great collector's item. It was a beautiful, low-winged airplane. And it had pontoons. It was a seaplane. And not only was it a seaplane, but the thing was beautifully made. I, I, it's, it's a great piece of thing. Oh, I looked at it. Oh, great. You know, and, and, and it had a, a... You could wind it up. It was made out of very light metal. And you could wind it up, and this thing would go over the water. The propeller would go. And it was seaplane. It had little pontoons. Oh, what a great gift. And my brother says, Wow, we... You know, and he grabs this thing, and he runs in, and he starts putting, uh, putting uh, water in the, in the bathtub. And for th months after that, he would sit there with this pontooned airplane going around him in his bathtub, you know. It's always taxiing constantly around him. <laughs> this thing is about ready to take off. He would not take a bath unless his airplane was in the tub with him. And he could wind it up and let it go. And it would just go around. The thing just went, oh, what a beautiful little thing. 
Well, I figured, well, if my kid brother is getting such a fantastic thing as a an airplane that goes, and you put it in a bathtub, and it taxis and everything else, it was a real airplane. I was really into my airplane phase at that time. Can you imagine what kind of a gift I'm going to get? So, I said, gee, that's, that's, uh, that's, thank you, Aunt Glenn, uh, Uncle Tom, uh, okay, I'll open it up, and, uh, hey, Ma, <laughs> Aunt Glenn, give me a gift. Well, I take the paper off. I should have known. I should have known. The paper should have ticked me off. Should have ticked me off right there. The paper was white with red candy canes all over it. Be careful of anybody who gives you a gift that has candy canes printed on the paper. That's just a, just a suggestion, because I'm a great Christmas gift uh, aficionado of the style and the school of various gifts. So I carefully take this paper off, and it was a box, a Christmas-type box that was about, oh, I would say, a foot wide, it was about six, seven inches deep, and about four or five inches high. I said, gee, uh, well, I wonder what's inside. And she says, oh, you're going to be surprised. That's something I know you're going to you're going to really enjoy having. My Uncle Tom just stands over there looking official, and he's talking to the old man, and they're drinking Jim Bean, <laughs> which is what Christmas was about to, to the grown-up type man. You know, they're sitting there drinking this Jim Bean. Ho, ho, ho. Well, I take the top of the box off, and there is nothing but tissue paper all covering this thing up. Tissue paper. I still see that tissue paper because what a trauma it brought on. What a trauma it brought on. That tissue paper. And some nights at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, I look up at the ceiling. I can peer through the vast, swirling snows and fogs and dreary mists of time, and I see that tissue paper, that accursed white tissue paper that hid that obscenity. I realized that I was about to experience a moment in my life where I would cease forever to be a kid and forever become an embittered adult. Yes. That moment. You can reset that, Joe, if you will, please. Uh, that moment. That moment. White tissue paper, and I took the corner of it and I pulled it back, and at first it looked I couldn't believe, you know, what, what the hell? Is it three guinea pigs looking out at me? What? I could see beady eyes looking at me. Beady eyes. And it was a wild thrill at first that went through me like I've hit the jackpot. Because if there's one thing my mother didn't want was animals around the house. She couldn't stand that thing. I thought for one minute, oh my God. I've got the, it's a, it's a, what is it? Is it, is it looks like a little bear or something. I've got, you know, what the? And there, in that box, surrounded by white tissue, were two furry bunny slippers with ears. Slippers, bedroom slippers, made in the form of bunnies. Yellow fur with two little beady eyes on the toes with little fake mustaches. <laughs> you know, the little whiskers that bunnies have? And the ears went back over the ankle. Two blue ears. What are they? My aunt glances, well, for, for cold mornings when you're getting ready to go to school, I thought that these Cute little bunny slippers would, would just be what you want. And I could hear in the bathroom my kid brother yelling and hollering, his airplane going, <laughs> Wow, look at it go, it's taking off. Oh, God, I got a pair of bunny slippers. Bunny slippers. Do you realize that bunny slippers 
are things which a three-year-old kid is already beginning to outgrow. Where the devil she got a pair of bunny slippers that would fit an, a, an 11-year-old kid who wore roughly size 22 shoes, I don't know. And then, the worst part of it is my mother says, Oh, how wonderful! Put them on! I sat down there on the sofa, and I had to. I had to fake it. I said, Oh, gee, they're really nice. Yeah. <laughs> bunny slippers, boy. <laughs> Oh, they're really great. Uh, yeah, bunny slippers. My mother says, put them on, put them on. I said, yeah, well, uh, I had to do it. I put on these two bunny slippers, and I walked around wearing these two bunnies on my feet. Do you realize how humiliating this is? Bunnies on my feet. Well, I went into the bathroom, and my kid brother saw these two bunnies coming in. He said, what are they? He figured there were two small animals coming in. And I said, no, the slippers. And we played with the airplane for half an hour. I was bugged. I wanted to steal it from him. Have you ever had, your brother had something you wanted to, no way. He didn't let that, do you know that he still owns that airplane? My brother still owns that airplane. He will not even still to this day let me get near it. Well, every time company came over for at least six months, my mother made me put on the bunny slippers. My Aunt Glenn would come and visit us every couple of Sundays. She'd say, now, now, don't forget, when your Aunt Glenn comes, put on the bunny slippers. I'd say, oh, no, bunny slippers. And I'll never forget the time that Lawrence Stryker, the magnificent human being across the street who had the purple letter with the white H, saw me in my bunny slippers. The word got around the neighborhood. Shepherd wears bunny slippers. He's a secret bunny slipper wearer. And I'll tell you, it took me years to outgrow that, and only at the point when I started to grow large shoulders and started to run over small yelling kids did the bunny slipper legend vaguely die, but it's never completely left my soul. So be careful. If you have a male-type kid between the ages of 10 and 13, be careful what you give them. Don't lay any that cutesy fool stuff on him. If you give him a copy, a leather-bound copy of Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy and a camel with the wrinkled knees, you've lost a friend for life. And in fact, you may well have made a dangerous enemy. So just something as a part of our public service programming, you ought to know that there are some pitfalls to Christmas that... Uh, Oh, incidentally, I just want to tell you, you just don't go outgrow these things. Two years ago, I'm talking to my mother Christmas on a telephone. She says, oh, say, uh, by the way, Jeannie, I says, yes, Mom. She says, say, you'll never guess what I ran across in your old room. She said, I'm going to send them to you. I, got, I ran across your old bunny slippers. You remember I used to love them? I said, yeah, Ma. You know, you carried it. Yeah, Ma. Like for years, I carried out a, a myth with my mother that I actually loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Because she thought I did. I hated them. What I dug was Twinkies and Yoo-Hoo. And fudge sick as the hell with peanut butter and jelly. So be careful, peoples. Be careful.